Hello, my name is Sunir Thobani. I teach in the Department of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us for this event. Uh, UBC is located on Musqueam territory and indigenous peoples are engaged in struggles for sovereignty over these lands. Uh, so I just want to bring that to your attention and also the necessity to build solidarity with these movements. Uh, I would like to thank the sponsors of this event, the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies at UBC um, for funding for this project, uh, the Cross Canada Network, researchers and academics of color for equity, race, and finally, the Department of Asian Studies at UBC for sponsoring and promoting this event. I would also like to thank Ritin the core for working with me in organizing this session. Uh, so I will introduce the presenters of this panel. Um, I will speak first, followed by Dr. Suvendrini Pereira, a former John Curtin Distinguished Professor at Curtin University in Australia. Uh, she will be followed by Farida Akhtar, one of the founders of Ubinig, the Policy Research for Development Alternative in Bangladesh, which among its many other activities has built one of the largest community seed banks in the world. Uh, Farida will be followed by Dr. Maeka Smart, Assistant Professor in the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State University. Our final speaker will be Dr. Radha D'Souza, Professor of Law, Development and Conflict Studies at the University of Westminster in the UK. Each presenter will speak for approximately eight to 10 minutes. And we will of course follow with a question and answer session. Um, this session will be recorded and uh, please feel free to post questions using the chat function during the presentations. We welcome questions and we'll be very happy to take them uh, at the end of the presentations. Uh, so I will begin with some general comments about the project and then um, I will kind of uh, focus a little bit on my research, my part of the research, which focuses on Canada. So the rapidity with which COVID-19 spread around the world caught governments and public health officials completely unprepared. Despite the initial belief that the pandemic would be an equalizer, this assumption fell apart immediately as infection and death rates proved to be disproportionately higher along the hierarchies of race, class, age, gender, disability, religion, caste, sexuality, and also across the north-south divide. Um, it soon became clear to us that the pandemic was deepening the structures of national as well as international inequalities. Our research team came together to study the interaction of the virus with underlying socioeconomic structures and the cultural politics that shape the relations among and between these communities. Uh, so my focus this morning is going to be on how the pandemic has been racialized. Uh, certainly we've had lots of uh, attention now paid to the anti-Asian hate crimes, uh, but I'm going to make a deeper argument for how the pandemic is actually uh, itself being racialized. Um, given the ideologically charged, not to mention xenophobic disinformation campaigns still underway in many of the research sites of this project, it is worth revisiting the emergence of this virus. It is popular knowledge that COVID-19 was first identified in an outbreak in China in December 2019. What is less well known is the history of this virus. SARS-CoV-2, which is of longer duration and with multiple geographical points of origin. The virus is common in bats, cats, and camels. It had hundreds of variants before it first became transmitted to humans. Six variants are known to have infected humans. The first of these appeared in the Netherlands in 2004, the second in Hong Kong in 2005, COVID-19 is the seventh and the most deadly of these, according to the editor-in-chief of The Lancet. The Trump administration, however, blamed the Chinese government for deliberately spreading the virus. 
the administration's rhetoric unleashed a wave of anti-Chinese and anti-Asian racism in the US and well beyond. In the case of Canada, early responses to COVID-19 included travel advisories for China, additional screening for arrivals from China, and government chartered flights to bring Canadians back from affected areas in China. In Canada, as elsewhere, public discussion fixated on Asian dietary practices, wet markets, hygiene, and sanitation conditions in China. Orientalist tropes of Asian degeneracy and Western vulnerability thus became revived, as did fears of a new yellow peril. With the pandemic becoming racialized in the social imaginary as an Asian threat, as a foreign invader, the parallel with earlier phases of overtly racialized Canadian nation building became obvious. Racial targeting of Asian communities also directed attention away from neoliberal restructuring, from the devastation wreaked by resource extraction and agribusiness, by rampant consumerism, privatization, and deregulation, and its effects on the environment, on fragile ecosystems, on local communities, and on animal species. Predictably, there was an escalation in hate crimes against Asians, which was immediately seen across North America. Although the initial attacks were directed at Chinese American, Chinese Canadian communities, these soon extended to other Asian, Black, other racial minority communities, as well as Indigenous peoples. So for example, as the second wave spiked in late fall 2020, in Canada, it was South Asian Canadians who would be blamed for the spread of the virus. Rising infection levels during the second phase were linked in the media, for example, to South Asian religious cultural practices, and more specifically to their communities, uh, places of worship, temples, gurdwaras, mosques. Canadian media reported extensively on Diwali celebrations, singling these out as a leading factor in the rise in infections during this period. Public attention was also drawn to the extended family structure in these communities as another factor of concern in the rise of the infections. The fact that these communities were hard hit by unemployment and underemployment, that disproportionately large numbers of them are engaged in low wage work and that they experience racism in access to health services were deemed matters to be not of public concern. The issue of concern in these accounts was these communities exotic and quote unquote foreign read as deadly cultural practices. The racial hatreds and violence that marked the earlier phase of the pandemic of course remains ongoing, ongoing and you know, we uh, witnessed the Atlanta shootings last week. Hate crimes in Vancouver has increased by 700% according to the police. The trends are similar elsewhere. The majority of these hate crimes have been against Asian women. The CCNC report just published yesterday points to a rise in these attacks from the beginning of the pandemic, the attacks have actually increased during January and February of 2021. These attacks have included violent assaults as well as being spat and coughed on, most took place in public spaces. The CCNC report notes that per capita, the racist hate crimes are higher in Canada than in the US. Many of course go unreported. So while it is important to address these acts of violence, it is also significant that the pandemic measures also have racialized consequences. It was very clear in the pandemic that people of color and indigenous communities were experiencing disproportionately higher infection and death rates, yet the pandemic measures did not explicitly counter these shocking disparities. So for example, in Canada's largest city, Toronto, 83% of all reported COVID cases are among Black and people of color communities, as were 71% of hospitalizations. In Canada's three largest provinces, re residents who live in neighborhood with higher communities of color, higher numbers of communities of color, 
are more likely to die from the virus, reports Statistics Canada. In BC, for example, communities that have higher than 5% ethnic minorities in their neighborhoods have mortality rates that are 10 times higher than those neighborhoods that have less than 1% of people of color communities. People of color as workers are also disproportionately located on the front lines of the virus. So immigrant women workers account for 31% of nurse aides, orderlies, and other service aides in the country. These statistics are from 2016, but the ratios are much, much higher in the major cities where the infection and death rates have been higher. So for example, 78% of these healthcare workers in Toronto, 71% in Vancouver, 70% in Calgary, 62% in Edmonton are immigrant women workers. And of course, immigrant is a racialized term. Infection and death rates have been highest in these urban centers where these women of color work in providing care to hospitals, clinics, care homes, Healthcare workers comprise 20% of all COVID cases in the country. This was double the rate for healthcare workers at the global level, as per the WHO reports. There is also overrepresentation of people of color amongst the ranks of other workers who provide essential services, from farms and meat packing plants to transit workers to grocery store workers to taxi and truck drivers. Migrant workers are another group that are at much greater risk. Canadian borders were closed off to most, most non-citizens in the first phase of the pandemic, but they remained open with delays and disruptions for migrant workers. Once arrived in their places of employment, these workers were required to quarantine for two weeks. Many of them reported being housed in bunk houses that at the best of times were known to be overcrowded and unregulated these bunkhouses became vectors for the disease. On many farms, employers were reported to make their workers sign away any rights they might be able to claim. And they uh, report going hungry, not having access to safe drinking water, and also to having their wages withheld. More than 30 farms in Ontario were reported to have outbreaks of the virus. Uh, so this uh, situation in terms of the racialized effects of the virus uh, is very serious with regard to indigenous peoples as well. The dire living conditions on reserves and in the inner cities for these communities are well documented that many indigenous communities have no safe drinking water and adequate housing, little or no access to health services has been known and documented for decades that these communities experience racism within healthcare and other social systems is also well documented, as are the higher levels of chronic health conditions among them. Yet in the middle of the pandemic, the government announced it would delay the release of the National Action Plan on murdered and missing indigenous women and provided no rescheduled timeline. The minister responsible for indigenous services announced that Canada would not meet its target to lift drinking water as advisories in indigenous communities, some of which have lived without unsafe water for decades that an infectious disease would quickly rage through reserves and detention centers, prisons and slums, through refugee camps and migrant quarters were also a certainty. Yet the pandemic measures adopted in Canada have taken a race-blind approach. My argument is that these measures have capitalized on racial gender equalities in the, mar in the labor market, in housing, in access to healthcare and other socioeconomic measures. I read a will to sacrifice that runs through these pandemic measures that have taken such a catastrophically higher toll on people of color and indigenous communities. The larger argument of course is that these measures are reshaping what the post-COVID-19 post, post world will look like. The political and socioeconomic calculus of pandemic measures has given a new level of lethality to the ongoing processes of racialization that continue to function in plain sight. 
so this is, you know, I'm, I have a larger uh, paper coming out of this research, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse of the kind of concerns that we are addressing in our research project. Um, we have uh, uh, research partners from Australia, uh, India, Bangladesh, Germany, Canada, the UK and the US who are part of this project. Uh, so I will now turn the platform over to Dr. Pereira and she will present her research next. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from uh, the land of the Wajak Noongar people. I'm uh, here in Western Australia. It's 2.19 a.m. So Please bear with me if I um, uh, seem to be flagging at, at certain points. Um, one of the things I wanted to say about this project um, that Sunero just um, pointed to at the end there was that it, it's, it, it's a project on intersectionality. And one of the fascinating things that came home to me uh, during the project was actually the intersectionalities not only within our national, uh, the different national contexts we were working in, but among the members of the project itself. And something that was very evident to me was the different in intensities, the different tempos at which um, we as researchers were, were living the pandemic. This was something I knew in the abstract, but really it was through the discussions that we had um, uh, of the team, which would occur for me late at night, for others early in the morning, that I actually realized how um, unequal the distribution of the pandemic was um, as, a, as a global phenomenon. So I'd really like to um, congratulate Sunera for uh, getting the project together and um, all the members of the team as well from whom I've learned um, a lot. I wanted to um, take a slightly different approach from Sunera and rather than presenting an overview, I wanted to pull out three aspects of uh, what has characterized the pandemic in Australia and to kind of um, just flag some of the theoretical implications of, of those three um, aspects. So firstly, uh, First Nations. Um, one of the features of the Australian pandemic, which is really very different from what has happened in North America, is that indigenous people have actually had infections at a lesser rate than the non-indigenous population, six times less likely uh, to contract COVID. And of the 909 deaths, there have only been, there have been, I say only just because I'm comparing with other nations, but there have been 909 deaths overall of COVID in Australia. None of those has been an indigenous person. And this is really a remarkable achievement. And, um, one of the reasons that this has, uh, this has been able to occur is that um, indigenous uh, leadership from the beginning was extremely strong and within the sort of confines of the pandemic really was able to assert a degree of self-determination. One of the things that they did very early was uh, preemptively close the borders. Uh, or to remote communities, restrict entry to remote communities, and also pretty much control uh, the messaging uh, within their communities and um, use local networks, local references, languages, and so on. Um, so I've, I've given some thought to this, and um, I wonder why, to a degree, this was um, this has been successful, and what what if, you know, when you think about the history of Australia, uh, borders, quarantine, prisons, confinement, are all technologies that have been used against the indigenous population. 
And this was one of the instances in which uh, actually those, uh, those uh, means, those techniques could, could be used within the community. Um, and there was a kind of acceptance of it, which I think comes out of uh, the colonial historical focus on borders and on the insularity, uh, you know, which is a characteristic of uh, the Australian state has been the Australian settler state. Um, and I guess the, um, I guess the sort of question that comes up here is um, how the border can be deployed in, in different ways and how, you know, the double-edged kind of uh, meanings of the border and functions of the border, which really, I think we, we've kind of been very happy in Australia to shut down the borders uh, within states, um, within the different states, um, against other states, and of course the national border. And uh, I, I wonder about um, the um, consequences of this after the um, pandemic, after we, if we see the end of the pandemic. In my own state, for example, in Western Australia, uh, we are seeing the signs go up, go up for a, a separate uh, state to leave the Federation of Australia. So um, I've been thinking about what are the consequences uh, and implications of um, you know, the imposition of borders. A uh, second uh, snapshot that I wanted to talk about was that if, um, if the indigenous uh, uh, management of the pandemic is one of the success stories of the Australian uh, experience, then one of its um, huge failures is uh, the management of uh, people in aged care homes. The mortality rate uh, in aged care uh, was 75%. So 75% of the people who died, died in aged care homes, which is one of the um, staggering uh, uh, rates of mortality, and it's one of the highest in the world. Uh, and here I thought that in terms of intersectionality, it was, it was worth pursuing uh, a little further the inter the inter intersections between um, particular demographics and institutions. And um, what uh, Stephen Thrasher, Afro African-American theorist Stephen Thrasher, talks about as the, the structures of viral transmission um, that infect not just, um, bod not just corporeal bodies, but corporate bodies, institutional bodies. And the kind of um, comorbidities and pre existing conditions of institutions. How did these intersect um, with particular demographics? And I think in the case of Australia, the, the kind of comor comorbidities and pre existing conditions are very much around um, neoliberalization, uh, privatization, and so on. Uh, I can see Ritin has got, um, I'm coming to the end of my time, but I just wanted to briefly flag also um, what Naomi Klein has talked about as pandemic shock doctrine. That is the way in which um, the pandemic has been um, mobilized as a means of implementing certain kinds of um, um, socioeconomic change. And I see that in particular institutions, one of the institutions I wanted to um, talk about, but maybe we can come, come back to this, um, is higher education, the way that uh, particular measures that have been put in place have, have uh, had certain ideological, clearly ideological effects in terms of higher education. Um, so uh, thank you. Shall I start? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Farid Akhtar uh, and I'm from Bangladesh. I belong to an organization called 
we made, we have been doing research on development issues for a long time. So this, in this particular research, and I thank Suneda for really including us in this research project, which has been very important at this time of pandemic to see the impact on some special groups of people um, who, uh, not because of the virus itself, but uh, because uh, of the pandemic measures and also because the system uh, was already um, falling apart. So I would um, really like to highlight on the two aspects. First of all, I, um, I want to say that uh, for many of you, maybe you don't have much idea about Bangladesh. Bangladesh is um, in South Asia, one of the South Asian countries. And since independence, Bangladesh actually was uh, following a development path mostly dictated by the international and multilateral agencies like World Bank, IMF, and they were actually pursuing that uh, we should follow new liberal development strategies um, and we should be market dictated and for our health, food, nutrition, and everything. So, uh, and also, you know, we uh, needed to change our uh, the agricultural uh, sector uh, to what it is called modern agriculture and um, basically a chemical based with fertilizer and pesticides. So uh, the idea was that we were told that the more modern our agriculture would be, uh, we, uh, it will release uh, surplus labor and this labor will then uh, be able to go to the cities for industrialized, um, for working in the industries. And um, um, so, and they, they will be able to provide uh, cheap labor. So uh, Bangladesh has been following the path of export oriented industry and particularly you in Canada, you must have seen the made in Bangladesh a uh, lot of uh, clothing in your supermarkets. Um, so the ready-made garment workers are producing it and, um, and they are offered as cheap um, labor and they don't require much skill. So as long as they can operate a machine, it is fine. So that was the comparative advantage we had. So in Bangladesh, uh, coronavirus was first detected in March. And from uh, March, uh, the government declared, never called it lockdown, but it is called general holiday. And it lasted um, this kind of lockdown, which uh, has shut down all the transports and um, offices and uh, schools, educational institutions and also the, some of the industries, but the uh, export-oriented industries were uh, kept open uh, after 15 days of the lockdown. So, uh, so before I go into what happened to you know, the uh, garment workers, let me give you a little bit of idea about the uh, farmers, because these uh, garment workers and are actually the sons and daughters of our small scale farmers. Um, and these small scale farmers mean uh, farmers owning less than one hectare of land. And um, um, they are uh, actually the majority, uh, more than 80% 80, 80 of the farming households are small scale farmers. But due to the adoption of modern agriculture methods, uh, or the dependence on the chemicals, uh, they have become uh, in indebted because they had to incur much more cash uh, cost for producing um, agricultural products. So because uh, subsidies were withdrawn, which were initially given for this. So the farmers were not doing very well actually in 
following the agriculture. And it's, as Sunera has mentioned in the beginning that we are working with the ecological agriculture and we are trying to re, uh, regain our lost seeds. Anyway, that is a different story, but um, uh, we found that um, the younger generation uh, of the agricultural families, farming families, are now coming to the uh, cities uh, to work in the garment factories, in the informal sector, and the service sector. So, uh, government had a program of uh, educating the girls, and uh, um, uh, but this helped actually garment industries to employ them because they needed some level of education. So, and during the pandemic, the farmers were also very much affected and these particularly the poorer farmers could not sell their products. The poorer farmers could not work um, because of the small uh, shortage of um, uh, markets, uh, market access. Uh, so, so just to say that farmers were already in problem um, after pandemic and also before pandemic. The lady at garment sector, although it started in the 80s, major garment sector um, earning about 34 billion dollars per year. And this is the real work of these young girls uh, and boys working in the factories at a very little wage. And there are, so uh, now we have about 75% of these are women and um, they are 29 years old or a little bit older, but they are mostly younger. And, uh, but uh, although we saw this initially, it was an uh, empowerment for them, but we found uh, in the recent years, these garment workers were not able to earn much. They, the factory owners were not paying them regularly and they were um, uh, working harder, but uh, really not getting uh, very much. The minimum wage was uh, only $95. It's like 8,000 taka. So what happened after the pandemic was um, the garment workers um, were asked to come to Dhaka to join the factories, even though the pandemic uh, was there and uh, the lockdown was there. They had to walk all the way to Dhaka because there was no transport available. But the industries told them that if you don't come, you won't get your salaries. So they came by on foot, basically. And uh, then they uh, uh, you know, uh, came, uh, some factories took them in, other factories started um, hanging names of the factory workers uh, saying that they are laid off. So for example, in one factory where they were, there are 1,200 workers, 709 workers' names are uh, you know, uh, there. Uh, are saying that they are no more required. And same thing, you know, they were not given any kind of explanations. When they asked for their salary, they had to sign up 15 papers without knowing what it is there and they could not um, ask for even their uh, salaries which were due to them before. So uh, by August, the delay rate of workers uh, was about 324,684 and uh, uh, 1900 RNG factories were shut down and then these uh, workers did not have enough saving. They could not spend, uh, stay in Dhaka uh, city anymore because they had to pay the rent of the houses and also uh, food was costly to them. So they had to go back um, uh, to their villages. And also already we, we knew that these uh, farmers, these workers uh, were um, anyway living on very little income 
and they were actually uh, buying their food from the local groceries on credit and they could not pay for their treatment uh, and everything. So that was the um, uh, situation. But when they were laid off, they some of them got uh, some area payments, but others were just asked to leave. But then uh, when they went back to their village, what happened? Um, thousands of uh, workers returned to their villages. And these are the um, workers who, used, who came to Dhaka. They had children, young uh, children, who they actually kept with their parents and they were uh, raising them up. But, and these workers used to pay their families for a support to raise their children. But when they went back to their villages and they had some savings with them, which, were, which was run out after um, uh, some time, these were, they were not welcome to their families either. So the, um, we, I have taken some case studies, uh, four, five case studies, and just I, um, it was shocking to see that um, the fam uh, these uh, workers who went back to their families, they uh, could not do anything in the villages. They could not help their families who were already in problem because they were, they are anyway very poor families. And, uh, and the families asked them to either leave their house or uh, do something. And they had no job uh, to do in the village. So I just, um, I cannot uh, talk about all the cases, but um, some uh, cases that I found was very sad um, was that um, um, even when one garment worker became pregnant, she was pregnant and she went back to her family. Her husband could not look after her very much. So she, he said that, why don't you go back to your parents' house because I cannot um, uh, manage the cost of her food. So she went back to her brother's house and her brother also said that either, you know, I cannot also manage um, your cost. So I cannot, um, so this woman is actually going from one place to the other and uh, she doesn't have any help. And I do not blame also the village people because um, they are already uh, in trouble and they uh, did not have enough support for themselves to, to meet this extra cost for, the, for their members who are coming back. So thank, thank you, Farida. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, can I just ask you to wrap up and then maybe we can talk more in the question and answer session? Yes. Thank yes. You. Okay. Um, so I, um, you know, so I'm almost done. And then, um, uh, so these are the families who had to, uh, who are still in the village, cannot do anything, and um, they cannot come back to Dhaka. But what I, I want to say that it's not the virus alone which is causing all this trouble. It is the system, the policies of new liberal development policies which already made the system weak and they cannot manage uh, it anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Farida, for your presentation. We have uh, Dr. Maeka Smart next. Hi, everyone. I have a couple of slides that I'm going to share that hopefully help anchor the presentation and guide you better through what I want to present today. So um, if I could just get a thumbs up or indication that you can hear me clearly and that you can see my screen, that would be really helpful. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So I am going to talk about COVID-19 disparities in the context of community mistrust, specifically in Flint, Michigan, which is where I work and I am located uh, 10 minutes away where I live right now. So I'm an assistant professor at Michigan State University in the College of Human Medicine. I direct uh, two programs that are relevant here because this is how I get my help to do the work that I do. 
students, wonderful students, and the leadership in medicine for the underserved and research to reduce disparities in disease allow me to function. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the city of Flint for those of you who have never heard of it. It is the home of the world uh, known Flint water crisis. And um, I want you to understand that even before the Flint water crisis, the city of Flint was already in distress. So this is an image that shows the total population by decade of the city of Flint and how it compares to the rest of Genesee County. So everywhere else, in Genesee County, population was going up. And in Flint, you can see how the population was going down over time, starting in the 1970s, when the local car factories, which was what so much of the industry was here, started to shut down. So this is a depopulating city, which has far reaching impacts in every sector, education, health, social, it just all was impacted. The Flint water crisis happening on top of this made matters worse. This is what the water crisis looked like. This is from The Guardian in 2016. And as you can see, the water that people pay for was coming out of the taps, discolored and unsafe for human consumption. Unfortunately, um, mistrust in Flint exploded because of the situation, because despite the fact that the water is clearly brown, orange, yellow, any other color than clear, which would it was, which is what it was supposed to be. Despite that, um, Flint residents kept getting told by the government and by other trusted people in power that there was nothing wrong with the water and that it would be safe to consume. Um, there was some shutdown, some redirection of water. There were um, mitigation efforts. Um, pipes have been laying, re, re put in. But the fact of the matter is, the mistrust in Flint is the damage that happened and it has been incredibly hard for the city to recover. That was 2016 and this is 2020. So this is around this time last year when COVID-19 hit. We all knew that we needed to stay indoors, um, but there was a line for water that got captured by my husband. So I'm going to stop talking for a moment and allow you to listen to the audio and see the visual of what the residents of the city of Flint have to deal with just to be able to consume safe water during a pandemic. It's gone five blocks. Five blocks of cars waiting for water. Water. So, I, as you can see, people are lined up. My husband's audio is saying five blocks. People are just waiting for water. The lines, um, whether people had to stand in line to get their water or sit in their car and drive up to get water, were uh, lengthy. Out, people would spend hours just trying to make sure that they had enough water to take home for a couple of days or as much time as they could survive in the pandemic without having to come back out. And I know that internationally, water problems are way worse than this. I understand that. But, you know, in a, in a state like Michigan, in a, in a county like Genesee County, this is pretty tragic for us. Oops, I'm sorry, I wanna go forward. Um, I want to just kind of reiterate one of Sonera's points that she made in the beginning here, that Black and Latino workers are over overrepresented among the essential, among the unemployed in the pandemic, and among the dead in the pandemic. So they're both employed in the most essential positions, over, overly under uh, unemployed, and um, they have uh, unrepresentative amounts of death. And so this is also uh, some data about this area here in Michigan. As you can see, Blacks' share of the cases of coronavirus reached 37% in the state of Michigan here. But the Black share of the population is right around 17%. Similarly, the Black share of deaths in the state of Michigan is around 42% but the black share of the population, again, is right around 
17%. So this is, you know, the data that supports the thinking that uh, for some minority populations, there is overrepresentation in the number of COVID cases and the number of COVID deaths. That drives mistrust. Mistrust is everywhere, but it's a lot worse here in Flint because of the already existing context with the, with the water crisis and the inability for people to feel like they can actually listen to the government officials. But nationwide, individuals would say they had no intention of getting the vaccination, especially Black people. And researchers who led the survey emphasized that there needs to be a lot better communication with reassuring the public about the vaccine and about the virus in general. The vaccine trials were no different. Um, it was very difficult to enroll Black Americans in vaccine trials. That is especially true here in Michigan and in the city of Flint. Lots of efforts had to be put in place to make sure that these subpopulations realized that they were important and that, they, they, that we needed to hear from them. Poor health communication drives some of this mistrust as well and drives some of this kind of hesitance to participate. And this is an example of one of the CDC um, and State of Michigan um, health communication tools that went out about the pandemic. And it's just too much for anybody to confidently feel like they've taken enough away from it. So even myself, as a doctoral trained public health epidemiologist, I look at this graphic and I wonder how on earth this was supposed to really educate the population that I work with here in Flint. So I got together with some of my students and we looked back. We looked back at a simple 34 item questionnaire survey that had been done in the community. That's about this like you know, refusal or hesitance to participate in public health and clinical research. And we kept it very simple. So you'll see on the left side of your screen here that there's a, a game. It's a prize drop game. And that is what drew people in, community members in, to inquire about what we were asking about. And so this is, you can't tell from the picture, but if you've ever seen the show, The Price is Right, this is very similar to the Plinko game. And they drop one of these little orange discs in and it bounces around and then it lands on a prize. And the landing on the prize uh, means that if they, if they take our survey, our brief 35, four item survey, 34 sounds like, like, but it went really quickly, like 10 minutes. They took that 34 item survey, they would get whatever prize they randomly landed upon. And the prizes range from like a candy bar to a $40 gift card to a local grocery store. Our results showed some things that we can take and apply to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've got some follow-up steps that I'll share with you as well. So what we found was that hesitation for research participation includes uncertainty of potential harm. So when researchers, clinicians, people, public health folks that are trying to get people to participate, whether it be a vaccination trial or just getting the vaccine, if you're not very upfront about what the potential harms are, participants are not gonna want to listen to you because they feel like there's something that's being hidden. Respondents felt like medical research needs to be closely regulated to prevent harm. And certainly you've heard of the many, many horror stories that come out of unregulated unre medical research. And unfortunately those stories persist. It's not like they've stopped. And then many respondents lack understanding of how research creates medical advances. Just imagine the average community member we found here in Flint do not understand that there are people called researchers that do stuff that's called research and that that's what creates medical advances. So even that basic uh, education is part of what needs to happen. The urgency around minority population participation, it's uh, quite obvious in this pandemic. And I showed you articles that, you know, kind of proven that with the research and the data that they've gathered. And our findings show that there's need for community messaging on the purpose and the process of research. 
Um, so our next steps are that we are planning to do focus groups with community members to get to really understand what it is that folks um, exactly don't understand and what might be helpful in very, very kind of bite-sized doses of information. We are going to do inter individual interviews with clinicians and study coordinators to understand if they under, if they feel similarly about the barriers to participation is what we get from community members. And then what we'd like to do is create an informational video about why research participation from every type of participant is critical for, us, for our medical advances to really be meaningful and to work. And then we are planning to do some interactive social media education about this. And so my students, two of them in leadership in medicine for the underserved are drafting a plan that includes um, uh, social media questions. These are quite popular and fun for people that actually love social media. They have questions that people can click their answers on polls that um, have a sliding scale with the heart that's very cute. Um, the students think that motivational quotes are quite popular in social media, so they're planning to do some of those. Um, like, did you know that participating in research saves lives? Things that are called to action statements and then linking resources and articles so that if people really are curious to learn more that they can. And so that's what we're up to here in Flint. And I look forward to the Q&A where I can share more if people are interested. Thank you so much, Maika. Uh, and we'll now move to our last presenter, um, Dr. Raza D'Souza. But let me remind participants, please feel free to post any questions, comments that you have using the chat function. I will ask you to please keep your videos off during the presentations because we have weak connections. We have participants from Bangladesh and Australia. So please keep your videos off at that time. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Radha, the platform is yours. Oh, thank you, Sunera. Thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this project. And uh, thank you to all the other speakers. I have learned a lot and I've enjoyed working with all of you. Uh, my presentation today is what I plan to do is to juxtapose uh, the situation, the impact of COVID-19 in the UK on marginalized communities and juxtapose that with this idea, this perception that the UK itself is a marginalized nation or becoming one. And I'll tell you the reasons for that in a moment. Uh, the meaning of marginalized communities in the UK is, uh, uh, is shaped by the Equalities Act 2010. And the Equalities Act 2010 lists what it calls people with protected characteristics. And people with protected characteristics include uh, age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnerships, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion, or belief, sex and sexual orientation. So when we use marginalized communities very broadly, that concept is shaped by the Equalities Act, which protects these communities from uh, indirect and dire direct or indirect discrimination, harassment and victimization at workplace and access to services. The act also requires all public policy makers to vet any policy or law for e equality impact. So equality impact assessment is a statutory duty in the UK. Now, unlike in many other countries, in the UK, data and information on how the pandemic was impacting marginalized communities was never lacking. Uh, very early on, right from the outset, the uh, lockdown was declared in, on 23rd of March, but the pandemic talk was uh, even earlier. But right from the outset, uh, May campaign groups, professional organizations, academic research funding bodies, scholarly communities, just everybody was writing and producing reports. And all these reports highlighted 
the ways in which marginalized communities were disproportionately affected by COVID. Uh, in fact, just a couple of days ago, the British Academy published what is to date perhaps the most comprehensive and nuanced study on the, uh, called the COVID decade. And it also did a companion report called Shaping Co the COVID Decade. And these reports address, uh, uh, you know, the and, and this report itself was commissioned by the government for uh, Office for Science to provide an independent review of the societal impacts of COVID-19. So what is interesting is that typically in the past, the medical sciences have done their research and then social sciences and humanities have kind of tagged along as an afterthought. But this time around, social sciences and humanities were from the outset involved in assessing the societal impact of COVID-19. Um, and uh, the British Academy report, and the reports, all these reports confirm what was very widely known, namely that the COVID-19 exacerbated pre-existing structural inequalities in British society and accelerated existing trends. So that was came out clearly in everything that was published. That sustained cutbacks to public spending on health, education, and so, social services for over four decades had left many communities vulnerable. That was very clear. That low paid jobs and wealth disparities had increased and even working families were queuing up at food banks. This was the pre-COVID situation. The British academic report is at pains to highlight the differential impacts along dimensions of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, age, abilities, and immigration status. The report was also clear that the impact of COVID-19 was going to be long-term and likely to last a decade or even more. Now, what is interesting in the British Academy report and indeed all the other reports that have come out is that while the empirical data and analysis has emphasized unequivocally the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on marginalized communities, these reports leave us with the question, and what next? And therefore what? Now, turning to the context, for the uh, for COVID-19. COVID-19 struck the UK when there was heightened angst about marginalization at multiple levels of society. And this angst overlaid the marginalization of protected communities in the Equalities Act or the marginalized communities. The impact of COVID on marginalized communities in the UK unfolded against the backdrop of Brexit. The UK had just formally exited the European Union on 1st January 2020, when COVID was declared a global pandemic by the WHO. The legal necessity to complete a complex trade agreement with the EU by the end of 31st December 2020 shadowed the disease throughout the year. So they were like, going side by side, if you like. The campaign to leave the European Union was driven by a sense that the UK was marginalized within the EU. Indeed, during the Leave campaign, the current Prime Minister Boris Johnson repeatedly claimed that Britain risked becoming what he called a satellite state within the EU. So that was uh, one level of marginalization. The Brexit campaign promised that sovereign United Kingdom would seek trade deals with other nations around the world. And that would put UK on the road to prosperity again. This was the basis on which the uh, Brexit uh, leave campaign uh, camp uh, promised or, or held out. These ambitions were scuppered due to another kind of marginalization that is known but rarely spoken about. The UK as a state, as a political institution, 
is inextricably entwined with the US state's giant military industrial media complex. A maze of multiple defense, security, intelligence sharing agreements, extradition treaties, arms production and sale, revolving doors between defense personnel and US defense establishment and much else makes the UK state politically already look like a satellite state of the US, but it's often politely referred to as the special relationship. Now, what the special relationship did was completely hampered UK's ability to go out and seek trade agreements with other countries as they thought they would do during Brexit. For example, notwithstanding the biggest economic downturn in 300 years as a result of COVID, the, there was increased demands for spending on nuclear weapons that they were not able to get into trade de deals with China and Iran because of the US rhetoric, anti-China, anti-US uh, Iran rhetoric there and other countries. I won't go into too much detail, but they were hamstrung by these things in, in, in another sense. But turning from the risks of marginalization at a global level, there was sub at subnational levels, there was a feeling or perception that uh, the, the, that other nations of the United Kingdom were marginalized within the United Kingdom. So in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, for example, the marginalized nations within the United Kingdom emerged from the Brexit campaign feeling even more marginalized. The three nations saw Brexit as economically disadvantageous to them and COVID fueled those sentiments as the UK government faltered and vacillated over COVID-19 response. So all these three nations took their own course and they developed their own strategies because they did not anymore trust the UK government to deliver a viable COVID plan. Now, <clears throat> therefore COVID-19 fed into some of those uh, su subnationalist uh, uh, sentiments. Now, why is this uh, uh, important? Because economically, this is the worst downturn in 300 years. Historically, pandemics like wars and market collapses lead to structural social change. The nature of these changes depends on the capacities of communities to rethink and re-envision structural changes in society. The extensive empirical studies and investigations and policy interventions accept the social architecture established by liberal capitalism as given, almost as a natural condition of social life. And liberal capitalism rests on institutional separation of economy and society. And that is why I juxtapose the two marginalizations, one which is economically driven and the other which is socially driven. The Equalities Act assumes that there will be a relatively stable labor market and it seeks to provide opportunities to those who are who are seen as lacking in social capital. That is communities that are lacking in education, in um, training, skills, whatever. And it seeks to give them equal opportunities. But these equal opportunities make sense if there are jobs. But when the job market collapses, what happens to the equal opportunities? This is a contingency that no economist has thought of. Economists speak about collapse of uh, financial markets, banking markets, etc. But a collapse of the labor market is less thought about. I will just wrap up with just a, a concluding on, on where I want to take this. That the labor market, uh, uh, labor has two dual characteristics. One is it is an economic category. And as an economic category, it's a commodity that is sold, bought and sold in the market. And that commodity has no social attributes. But labor as class, as working class, people who belong to a certain uh, sector, always does not exist in the abstract. It always exists in the con concrete. And every worker has some race, some religion, some uh, nationality, some characteristics. 
but it's this in this uh, institutional separation and what law does and this is my core argument is to institutionally separate the economic aspects from the social aspects so the equalities act was uh, grew parallel and the historically with another kind of if you look at the equalities act from 1965 the race relations act you know was modified and it 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 developed alongside the labor market restructuring in uk so alongside the supply chain economy so you had two parallel things happening you had the race relations happening and you had the economic restructuring which moved to a supply chain model deindustrialization deunionization all of that but we never connected those two things so the question i'm asking is now with the new restructuring that is coming upon us are we again going to make the same uh, uh, do go along parallel lines talk about uh, equality and, and social equality and at the same time allow a labor market restructuring to happen with where what is given with one hand is taken away with the other or do we have the capacity to rethink and reimagine another kind of in intervention where the economic aspects and the social aspects can work hand in hand that's Thank where you. I would deliver. Thank you very much, Radha. Thank you all uh, the presenters for your presentations.